Subscribe if you like scary stories. I used to work at a hospital near where I lived when I was a kid. My shift was from 2.30 p.m. to 11 p.m. One evening, after my shift, a few buddies and I decided to hang out at a well-known pub close to the hospital. We sat, had a couple of beers, and really enjoyed ourselves. Soon it was getting late, and I had to head home. The pub was located on a one-way street, so I had to drive a block, turn left, go another block, and take another left. This brought me to another one-way street, but this one led me towards the highway. As I was driving, I had to stop at a red light. Now, it's key to mention that I was driving a big GMC pickup truck with a cover on the back. The truck used to belong to my dad, who's no longer with us, so it was pretty special to me. The only part I wasn't keen on was the lack of air conditioning, which meant I usually had the window half, if not all the way down. While I was waiting at the red light, a ragged-looking lady approached me and asked if I wanted to party. To say she smelled bad would be a huge understatement. I declined her offer, but she didn't leave. Instead, she jumped on the running board of my truck, lifted her dirty shirt, and exposed herself. I quickly locked the door and asked her to step away from my truck, praying that the light would change soon. She kept talking, and I noticed she was trying to peek over my truck cover. Looking in my side mirror, I saw a young guy sneaking around trying not to be seen. I didn't know what they were up to, but I knew it couldn't be good. I asked the woman to get off my truck again, and when she didn't, I nudged her a bit. She held onto the side mirror to keep from falling off. The moment the light changed, I pressed the gas pedal, and the guy who was sneaking around stood up and began to chase me. The woman held onto my truck for a few seconds before letting go. I reached the next traffic light, which was red, but it gave me a chance to roll up my window. I glanced back and saw the pair pointing at me, apparently arguing about the woman's failure to keep me distracted. I got home without any more problems, but I decided never to visit that part of town again. This happened back in the early 90s. I used to work as a guy who took x-rays in a big hospital with several buildings. I worked in the evenings, and I really enjoyed it. I had some really cool people working with me. One of them was one of my best pals. One day I got beeped for a phone call. I picked up the phone and said, Hi, this is Luke. There was a brief silence. Then I heard a woman's voice. She thanked me for being so nice the other night. I was a bit surprised, but I said thank you and asked who she was. She paused again and said I'll find out soon, and then she hung up. I was confused, and I thought maybe my friend was messing with me. I didn't tell anyone about the call that night, thinking the person messing with me would eventually slip up. I went home and didn't think about it. But a few days later, I got another call from the same person asking if I was thinking about her. I told her I wasn't and that I was too busy for these games. I hung up. When I left work that night, I noticed a note on my truck. It said I made a big mistake by disrespecting her and that I would regret it. I threw away the note and went home. Later that night, around 2 a.m., my phone rang. It was the same voice, telling me I'd get another chance before hanging up. The next day, I told my friend about the calls and the notes. I told him it wasn't a funny joke. He said he didn't know what I was talking about. I explained everything to him and watched his reactions, but he didn't smirk or laugh. A few more days went by, and I had almost forgotten about it. On my day off, I had to do some chores and decided to go to the mall. I got hungry and decided to grab a bite at the food court. That's when I noticed a woman sitting and staring at me. I felt uncomfortable and threw away my food wrappers and left. I kept looking around to see if she was following me, and to my surprise, she was. I kept walking with no real destination and she kept following me. I hid in a store with two levels and managed to lose her. I was freaked out, but I had no idea who this woman was. That night I was lying in bed, unable to sleep, thinking about her non-stop. Around 2 a.m. my phone rang and it gave me a real fright. I picked it up and told her to stop bothering me or I would call the police. The phone went silent with a click. About an hour later, I heard some noise outside my house. I got up and started checking all the doors and windows when I noticed a shadowy figure near my truck. I called 911 and explained what was happening. 
they sent a police officer to my house. I stood by the window, hoping the officer would arrive quickly before the person left. Luckily they did, and the woman was still there. She was arrested, and the officer told me that she seemed to be on some kind of drug. She had a note about how I had disrespected her, and she was planning to put it on my truck. She also had a knife with her, but didn't say what she was planning to do with it. They said they were going to take her to the hospital for a checkup, and recommended that I get a restraining order. I never found out what happened to her, and thankfully, I never saw her again. This all went down back in the 80s when I was a healthcare worker. I was stationed in a mental health facility, so there were plenty of really wild experiences. I encountered numerous people who were a bit confused, but they were always something we could manage. But then one day, there was this one patient, Jake, who was completely out of control. I mean, this guy made the character that Jack Nicholson played in The Shining seem as harmless as Mary Poppins. The guy was obsessed with causing trouble. It was really upsetting and I hated going into his room when it was my turn to assist him. One evening, I was making my rounds, and at night, our patients had to sleep, so we turned off all the lights except for a few, so the whole corridor was dark. The only light I had was from my work pen, which had a light button on it so I could shine it down the hallway to see. I headed towards Jake's room to check he was in bed and asleep, but as I got near Ward 13, the door was wide open. With just my pen light illuminating the room, it was in chaos. Furniture was flipped over, sheets were ripped, and there were what appeared to be blood splatters on the walls. It looked like a tornado of insanity had blown through. What made it even more terrifying was that Jake was considered a threat, so we had secured him with sturdy restraints on his arms and legs, yet somehow he managed to break free from these, which was nearly impossible. With a sense of dread, I cautiously moved towards the door that led to the basement storage area, a place only staff were allowed. But we had searched everywhere else for him, and this was the last place left, so he had to be there. Suddenly, I spotted a shape moving behind some shelves. I didn't know what was going to happen next, but I was ready to defend myself against this maniac if he tried to attack me. I carefully navigated through the tight passageways, trying to locate Jake. It was pitch dark and quiet and still. The only light I had was from my pen. In a corner I saw Jake crouched next to an old locker. He was holding a shiny scalpel in his hand, and he was grinning. Paralyzed by fear, I watched as he stood up, a chilling grin on his face. He started moving towards me, the scalpel in one hand. He lashed out at me with the scalpel, barely missing. I evaded him and fought back. In the middle of this struggle, as Jake wielded the sharp tool, another nurse rushed in. She was holding a syringe filled with potent medicine and injected it into Jake's back, sedating him. Almost immediately, the medicine began to take effect, and Jake fell over and lost consciousness. Security showed up soon after, and they assisted us in fully restraining Jake, ensuring that he wouldn't hurt anyone else. After this terrifying event, the hospital opted to transfer Jake to another mental health center that could offer more intensive care. They realized how serious his condition was, and wanted him to receive the specialized care that he needed. Since then, I've never encountered a more extreme patient than him. I want to share with you a spooky tale about my meeting with a really scary patient in the hospital ward. I've always been interested in healthcare because I'm pretty good at looking after others. I'm a 23-year-old lady who works at my nearby hospital during night shifts. One evening I walked into room 307 which was a single room, and there on the bed was Mr. Smith, an old patient in his late 80s who was seriously ill and blind in both eyes. He was a smart man who was totally fine with his life coming to an end. I should mention that we kind of liked each other. I tried not to get too close to patients who wouldn't be around much longer, as it was tough on my mental health. When I got close to his bed, Mr. Smith turned his head towards me, and his foggy eyes looked at me, his voice scratchy as he spoke. The nurse is here. I've been waiting for you, my dear. I smiled back and said, Good evening, Mr. Smith. How are you feeling today? He laughed quietly. His laughter was always soothing, making me believe that everything will be all right in life's long journey. Feeling? Oh my dear, I'm just an empty shell floating between worlds. 
Time doesn't matter much to me now, he said. It was the weirdest thing I've ever heard him say since I started taking care of him. I knew him to be philosophical and profound, but this was really odd behavior for him. I did my best to understand what he meant, but nothing made sense. Confused and quite scared, I asked, What do you mean, Mr. Smith? Just like a butterfly, you will also awaken in your own time soon, my dear. Those words hit me like a ton of bricks. They were exactly what my late grandma used to say, a sign that change and development happen in their own time. How did Mr. Smith know this? I started to cry because of the strong feelings I was experiencing. I was afraid, but puzzled. I couldn't resist my curiosity anymore. My voice shaking, I asked, How? How did you know about that saying? It's something only my grandmother used to say. Mr. Smith's weary eyes met mine and he looked sad. Some bonds are stronger than life, we both cried together, holding on to that moment. I didn't want to understand everything that had happened, but it made me feel something deep inside. Mr. Smith's words about my grandmother were like a secret, something I couldn't explain but held on to tightly. As time went by, I kept those words close to my heart. They comforted me when I felt lost or uncertain. I believed that my grandmother's love continued beyond her death and gave me strength and hope. Standing here today, I carry the wisdom of those interconnected voices. I accepted the mystery and the things I can't fully understand. Mr. Smith's experience showed me that there are bonds that transcend time and space, and they provide us with a sense of direction and meaning. So I carry on with my journey, with renewed strength and an open mind. The mysteries of life unfold in front of me like a butterfly coming out of its cocoon. I was just an ordinary 29-year-old woman, living my life and attempting to make a difference as a hospital nurse. The job was thrilling yet tough at times. One day, a patient named George Smith arrived with a broken leg. From the first moment I saw him, there was something unusual about him. His piercing stare was creepy. We often have some odd patients, but George was in a league of his own. The energy around him was strange, which made me incredibly uneasy. He stayed at the hospital for several days because we had to perform additional surgery on his leg. As time went on, it felt like he was developing an unsettling interest in me. He would persistently ask me uncomfortable questions and even act inappropriately towards me, for which he was reprimanded by other nursing staff. About a month after his discharge, I never saw him again, which relieved me. He was the most peculiar patient I had dealt with in my nursing career. One day, while I was preparing medicine at the nursing station, I heard a soft voice from my right side. Lovely eyes, Amy. I was startled and turned to see George. He surprised me, so I asked him how he had become a nurse so quickly. He had completed nursing school, he said, and just happened to get a job here. He laughed as if it was an amusing coincidence. From then on, George seemed to be trailing me everywhere. He would appear unexpectedly in the hallways or outside the hospital, always observing me while I was doing routine tasks. He somehow got my phone number and started sending me text messages with eerily personal details about my life. I was scared because I had no idea how he knew so much about me. I assumed a co-worker was giving him information, so I tried to dismiss it. One evening, after a long shift, I noticed a shadowy figure across the street as I left the hospital. My heart raced when I recognized that it was George, silently watching me. I quickened my steps, avoided eye contact, and jumped in my car. After this incident, George's text messages became more frequent and disturbing, mentioning parts of my day he couldn't possibly know unless he was tracking me. At this point, I was truly scared and didn't want to be alone at night. One evening, I finally got some time to relax and have a blast with my buddies. We went to a popular local spot, laughing and enjoying each other's company. It was a well-deserved break from the work stress. As the night unfolded, my phone vibrated with an alert. I checked it, and my heart plummeted. It was a notification from my home security system indicating movement at my place. My friends noticed the shift in my demeanor and asked what was wrong. It's George, I mumbled, my voice quivering. My security camera caught him prowling around my house in the dead of night. My friends were equally alarmed. Amy, this is serious, said my friend Lisa. You need to call the police right now, and we should get to a safer place. We quickly left and went to Lisa's place, 
She was the only one among us whom George hadn't approached, as she didn't work at the hospital. Once we reached her house, we sat down to monitor him via the security camera and phoned the police. George was trying to force his way into my house, attempting everything from prying open the windows, climbing onto the roof, to trying to bust down the door. The police assured us that our safety was their priority and were on their way. While waiting for the police to arrive, my friends stayed by my side, offering comfort and support. The police arrested George almost immediately upon reaching my house. In the weeks that followed, an investigation was launched. It was discovered that he wasn't a real doctor. He had been pretending to be one and had worked at the hospital for weeks. I had a hard time sleeping after learning that I had been stalked for months and was clueless about it. All the details he had about me came from my medical records that he had somehow obtained from the hospital. Even now, I occasionally reflect on the incident, but since then I haven't heard anything about him or even his name, 